Christmas. And I know you're like, wait a second, are you one of those people, Craig, who, who celebrate or Christmas starts, uh, you know, even before Thanksgiving? Uh, Pastor Steven's clapping. I guess he's one of those guys. Um, I'm not one of those guys. Christmas season, um, I start listening to Christmas music um, r- right after Thanksgiving. Like that, that's, that's my cup. sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger and suddenly there was a great multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those whom he is pleased. Let's all stand and we're gonna I'm gonna read that again and I, I want us to just to just meditate on those words and and to worship the Lord for unto us the Savior was born and we don't celebrate that's just that on December 25th or, or we don't start saying those words, glory to God and, and worshiping him. Father, we come and we say glory, glory in the highest. Father, we worship you this morning. you, God, and we lay our burdens down. God, in the valleys, we worship you. On the mountaintops, we worship you because you never change. You are unchanging. And so we sing glory to the risen King. Let's worship the Lord this morning, for he is worthy of all of our glory. Say, great is the Lord. Great is the Lord, God Almighty. Great is the Lord on high. Sing the train of his robe. The train of his robe fills the tent. We cry out highest praise. Sing glory. Glory to the risen King. Glory to the Son. 
Son, glorious Son. Lift up your heads, open the doors, let the King of glory come. Holy is the Lord. Holy is the Lord on high. Let all, let all the earth bow before you. Crown you, Lord of all. Glory, glory. still stands great is your faithfulness faithfulness I'm still in your hands this is my confidence you've never failed me yet I know that 
blessing. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. He's been my fourth man in the fire, time after time. Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. Now, this is the song. Here we go. I trust in God. Perfect. Perfect submission.
going through some things and, and, and you are and in our hearts you are hard to see you are there and you will answer our prayers or if we are celebrating if we're in a time of glory and, and worship because we are in the time of the mountaintops God you are there and we thank you for that and so it is our prayer God and if it's not our prayer we ask that you make it our prayer that we seek you for we know that you will answer God we sang songs like glory so we worship you this morning. We give glory to you in the highest. God, we sing songs that you haven't failed us yet and you never will. Because when we seek you, God, and even when we don't seek you, you are there and you answer. Maybe sometimes it's not what we think, but you are there and you answer, God. And we thank you for who you are, God. We thank you for those answers. We continue to worship you this morning. All right, good morning, everyone. If I can have the Gleanings team just come up. All right. You know, um, uh, a lot of our youth, like during the summer, parents have to find camps for them. Uh, churches often go on like youth camps and stuff like that. Uh, you know, and they have fun. They do games and maybe, you know, there's a lake or whatever. Um, but we don't do that at Cornerstone with our youth during the summer. Uh, this team of youth and the counselors, uh, try and scoot as far in the middle as you guys can. Yeah. Um, from July 30th to, to, to August 4th, so next Saturday, I believe, through that week, uh, they will be in uh, Danuba, California. So just to give you an idea of Danuba, um, the good news is it's not going to rain. Uh, the high today in Danuba is going to be 110 degrees. It's in the valley uh, in Central California. Uh, it's going to go down, so you know maybe God will have mercy on you guys. Uh, but they go and 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 during the week they uh, work at gleanings, and uh, it's it's such a unique camp because you get to uh, labor together, you get to travel there together, you get to labor together. Uh, they will process um, fruit that they can't sell at the markets, uh, and then they will dry it, lay it out in the field, and dry it, um, and then pick it all up, and then process it. Uh, it's it's a uh, it's a pretty pretty uh, labor intensive thing. I thought we could, if everybody can just quickly stand, if you're able to, real quick. Like, and just like bend down and make like you're picking up something, <laughs> okay? And like, but you gotta like flip it over to make the fruit face up. Okay, now stand up 
And we're gonna do this like a thousand more times, <laughs> but it's not like 110 degrees in here. You guys can be seated. Right, so just give you a little preview. It's backbreaking work, <laughs> uh, and it's really hard and challenging. Uh, you know, I grew up in the country, uh, but you know, all you city kids, you, you guys have a big surprise waiting for you. <laughs> uh, but it's good, and they have ministry times. It's, it's a great bonding opportunity for all of our, our youth to get together uh, and just get to know one another. Uh, so, um, yeah, so I'm going to commission them and pray for them. Uh, you know, uh, normally we pray for protection and safe travel and all those things. And, you know, that, that's all great. Of course, we want you guys to get there safely and come back home. Um, but, you know, God really works when we need him. Right. And we often need him when things are hard. Right. And so, you know, I want you guys to meet God and all the things we just sang about. Right. You know, you'll see God do it again and again while you're there. Right. You're going to see his glory, whether it's waking up in the morning and seeing the sunrise or being thankful when you see the sun go down. <laughs> um, and, you know, uh, it's, it's just it's just an amazing time that you guys can meet God together as a team. So uh, if you guys can extend a hand, let's commission this team. Yeah, Heavenly Father, we just, we do, Lord, we pray for safe travel down there and back. Um, but yeah, as Pastor Stephen leads the team and with his team of leaders and uh, all the older kids leading the younger, Father, I just pray that you meet him there, that your God, your, your, your appointments, those circumstances, that you would put them in the places, Lord, where it's clearly evident that they need you and that they'll have to rely on you and cry out to you for help, whether it's, it, it's a problem with the rental car or the rental vans or just being tired and not being able to pick up another rack of fruit, whether it's getting a little bit motion sickness as the fruit goes by on the conveyor belt, or just being hot and uncomfortable. Mm. Yeah, Father, I just pray that you would just, Holy Spirit, just come among this team and use them. Use them to process all that fruit so that those in need can get it, and that you'd meet them as they do it together, Lord. Uh, yeah, so Father, I just pray that you would challenge them this week, and that, that adversity would draw them closer together and closer to you, Lord. And what a great place that would be, that we can all be together with you. Mm, so Father, I just pray as they travel, Lord, uh, we'll, we'll miss them during the week, uh, but we look forward just like when Jesus sent out the disciples and they were so excited when they came back, Lord, uh, that we will hear amazing stories, transformation, that the passion that they have for you will be able to come out freely as they worship you together, as they labor together, as they, as they bake together in the sun, as they play together and they travel together, Lord. Father, unite them as one team in your spirit. Thank you for what you will do. Thank you for taking care of them, Lord Jesus, and for always giving uh, your best and having our best intentions in mind. So Father, we just bless this team. We commission them as they head out uh, that they would have just an amazing, fruitful time at Gleanings at the YMM Mission, that they'll be a blessing also to the staff. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, uh, Pastor Stephen's gonna come up and give, some, give us some announcements. You, you guys can be dismissed. Thank you, Rob, for that prayer. And uh, good morning, Cornerstone. Glad you guys could participate in the ministry of gleanings with us. Um, and uh, you got a little taste of what it'll be like. Um, it's going to be really hot down in California, but it's perfect today for a picnic. So I see a lot of you guys came dressed, ready to play some sports. Um, I'm really looking forward to eating food and playing volleyball with you guys. 
Uh, my bumping, setting, spiking, and serving all need work, but it'll be, it'll be fun nonetheless. Um, uh, one type of service that's a little bit easier than volleyball serving is our Jubilee Reach Service Day, which is taking place August 26th uh, from 8 to 12. And this is a, a pretty exciting opportunity because um, the Jubilee, Jubilee Reach serves um, 22 schools in the Bellevue School District. And um, we get to participate uh, with serving uh, Lake Hills, which is the place that we've been at, we had a relationship with for all these years, and so we can give back to helping the teachers prepare their classrooms for the school year. We can give back um, by, just as like a thank you for letting the, uh, us rent their space. And so if we can be a, a blessing and a good neighbor to them, um, it's a heck of a lot easier than returning uh, some of those fast volleyball serves. So come on, come on down, sign up for that. You can register on the Cornerstone app. Uh, with that, uh, I'd like to now invite Pastor Joe up to give our next announcement. Thank you, Stephen. Um, is that some clapping? That's so funny. <laughs> that is so funny. All right. Well, anyways, um, the announcement I have is on October 13th to 15th, we have our upcoming Ultra True Treat plan, which is great. We hope that you sign up. We hope that uh, it's just going to be a wonderful step of faith for us to gather as a church family uh, together as we grow in our across the generations. That's the theme, across the generations, that we really want to see uh, our, our growth and our bonding uh, across the generations at the retreat. We need your prayers. And not only do we need your prayers, but we, uh, Pastor... Um, Brian Kim needs your prayers. He will not be able to come and speak to our church family, unfortunately, because his father has uh, coming to the, I think, to the close of his life. Um, it's not clear exactly what's happening with him, but uh, Pastor Brian isn't going to be able to share with us due to the health of his father. And so we really want you to pray for him and his family uh, but also pray for us as we uh, seek out another speaker for a retreat. Um, you know, in the past, uh, we've seen something similar happen on our mission trips to um, Cambodia and Vietnam, where at the last second, something changed. And uh, because of that, we got in, uh, in contact with someone who has been someone very special to our church and has opened up the doors for us, actually, to go into other countries in Southeast Asia. Uh, what turned out, you know, what seemed as uh, a challenge at the beginning turned out to be such a blessing. And that's what we're anticipating. So at this time, um, I'm going to pray for uh, Pastor Brian and his father, and you join me. And then after that, we're going to also uh, dismiss the, the children to rock ministry. So would you join me? Father God, we just uh, come before you, and we lift up uh, Pastor Brian and his family, especially his father, um, Lord, uh, when we look forward to our own personal, our, our family retreat, um, there's um, just a need for us to have someone come and share your word with us. But Lord, um, we know that this family, uh, they're hurting right now. And so we want to intercede on their behalf. We pray healing over Pastor Brian's father, we pray comfort as they go through this, uh, this time that it's very, very difficult. Um, Lord, for us, we pray that you would provide the right speaker to come share with us. And we pray that um, through this, we would just see your hand and that we would see the working out of the lyrics of the songs we've been singing today. Uh, God, you've never failed and you won't fail. And so thank you, Lord, that we could, with full faith and trust, uh, believe that uh, you're going to work all things out for the good to those who love you, who are called according to your purpose. And now, Lord, I pray that as we dismiss our children into the rock ministry, that you would bless them. Lord, may you use the teachers, the coordinators, the helpers. Lord, would you just use them to impart to our children wisdom and knowledge of you. 
We pray that the love of Christ would come through every interaction that these children have. And we pray that the seeds that are sown into their hearts would blossom one day into full faith and service to you, Lord. We thank you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to go ahead and, as they're dismissed, go ahead and stand and greet one another in the Lord. Hello, hello, Cornerstone. What a great day that God has made. Super sunny and warm outside. 
Uh, in this long-term missionary uh, segment, care segment, I want to remind you to pray for our missionaries uh, all over the world. Uh, if you go into the app, there's a mission. No, there's actually a ministries button, and under there you will see the LTMC prayer request. So remember to do that. Whether you tie something around your finger or you set an alarm or you put posters around your wall in your home, any way it's done, please pray for our missionaries. I have a couple more announcements uh, before we go on. N I was going to ask this, I'll ask it anyways. When does food taste the best, right? And it's obvious that food always tastes the best when it's free, right? <laughs> if you're like me, after church, you always try to figure out, whoa, what are we going to eat? And then you and your family start going back and forth. We ate this four weeks ago. Seven and a half weeks ago, we ate this, so let's not go there, right? Well, we're going to make it really easy. Today, of course, we have the picnic. Next week, we're going to also have free food. So after service, don't try to figure it out. Go to the ministry center. Helen Liu and Stephen Liu are going to be hosting a luncheon for their friends, uh, Drew and Michelle, they used to be Helen's uh, pastor a while ago. They are now missionaries in Costa Rica. And so they really want to meet everybody here. So grab your kids, grab your friends, grab strangers, go over to the ministry center. They're going to have a lot of food there. And we actually want to run out of food. And we want to maybe have God multiply. I'm not sure. But go to the ministry center next week. There's going to be desserts. There's going to be drinks. There's going to be uh, tray sandwiches, I think which tastes best when they're free. So remember that. Um, also, so that is next week after church, ministry center. Three weeks from now, we're going to have our first Oaxaca intro meeting for this, uh, this year. We're going to be going to Oaxaca probably around December time frame. And so three weeks from now, August 13th, in the library upstairs, I'm going to be holding a Oaxaca intro meeting. So if you're interested in going, you can't go to gleanings anymore to serve and to b do missions, but you can still go this year to go to Oaxaca and serve and minister to other people. So uh, we have that. Now, I want to introduce a special person. Her name is Kabeta and also Mutu, who will be sharing over a video. Uh, Mutu is the director of YWAM in India. And they and Kab uh, Mutu and Kabeta have been serving uh, in Y1 for over 20 years, and they have over 15 ministries, one of them that they're, is just starting to, uh, they're trying to start up, uh, and it's called the Home for the Destitute. Uh, as we know, India and Mumbai, where they're uh, uh, located, is a very dense, very populated area with a lot of poverty, and so there's a lot of opportunities for the gospel there as well. But uh, I think we're going to roll into the, the video, and then Kavita will share after. It's not easy for you to watch, it's very difficult, very heartbreaking. So if you do not wish to watch this video, please do not watch it. Mumbai is one of the largest cities of the world. There are 30 million people in our city. Every day thousands of people move to the city of Mumbai looking for meaning, life and prosperity. There are over 300,000 homeless in our city. And there are thousands of destitute who do not have anybody. And these people, they are on the road looking for food, looking for health, looking for meaning to their lives. And some of them are very badly wounded and they have a lot of worms. Our team have been serving these precious people in the last three years. We have served over 200 people. We provide medical care, we provide counseling, we provide prayers. We also take them to various shelter homes. But in the recent years, we found that all the shelter homes are full and there is no place for them. And these people are dying on the road. And our desire is to build a beautiful home for them so that these precious ones can live peacefully 
and they can find Jesus, they can die with the dignity. So our vision is to build a great place for these precious people who are on the road dying in the city of Mumbai. We ask you to pray for us, join us, so that these people can find the hope in Christ. Thank you so much and may the Lord bless you and may the Lord reward you. God bless. Okay, good morning once again. And I really want to uh, say, first of all, the Lord has given this time, and I want to say thank you to God. And the second thing, I really want to say thank you, Pastor and elders of the church. And it's not, uh, 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 of course, the church you are seeing first time, uh, me, and but uh, I'm married, and my husband is Muthu, and we have three children. And uh, 2015, God has uh, given us a vision to go and start the ministry in Mumbai, but we have moved uh, 2017. And God has really using us tremendously, and we have three children, Princey, Prince and Precious, 19, 16, and 14. And we are serving the Lord with the, by faith, and uh, uh, first we are nine staff, now we are having 45 staff. And first thing is we do the discipleship training school, as you know, YWAM. And we have a training school of urban mission, and we do have a training for the school of evangelism and pioneering. And these three trainings, and we do, and we train the missionaries to send in India and also beyond. And that is one of the ministry we are doing last uh, 29 years in YWAM. And the other thing is with this, uh, I want to say thank you uh, once again for the education ministry. The church has given. Uh, uh, offering for the education ministry and also the ambulance which you seen in the video and the church has blessed for the um, destitute people. We really want to say thank you so much and also for the COVID time you have blessed us a lot of uh, 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 lot of groceries for the poor and needy. I want to say thank you from bottom of my heart and even though you are he here but your work is you are doing and partnering with us in the city of Mumbai. And continuously I want to ask you to pray for our work and mainly like you saw in the destitute. And this is my last uh, uh, week in USA. And we are looking actually uh, home for the destitute to raise some fund and build. And before that I want to say uh, some of the mission trips we are looking, short term mission trips who can come and visit us and see our ministry. Once again, thank you so much. My God bless you. Yeah, Home for the Destitute is a big vision to be able to uh, provide for so many, so many millions of people uh, in that area. 
Uh, but uh, Cornerstone, we will be matching actually any donations that you give to Cornerstone with the memo or any indication that is for India. It will be matched 100%. So if you give $200, it will be matched and they will receive $400. Uh, of course, our limit is going to be $5,000 for the matching, but you can give as, you, as, the, as the Lord leads. And uh, what else am I supposed to say about that? Oh, that goes until the end of August. And so any, anything you give that says India in some way, some fashion, it will be matched. And also, Kabeta will be at the back. If you want to hear more about what God is doing in, in India or how you can pray for them or how you can, I don't know, more details, she will be in the back and you can find her. I don't think you will miss her. So let me pray for them. Uh, let's pray. God, I thank you so much for Kabeta and for Muthu, the call that you gave them 20-some years ago, Lord, to serve you in India. And, Father, we thank you that you have provided all along and you have been faithful all along. And now they have a vision that is greater, uh, Lord, than uh, what we can imagine, which is to uh, buy a land, uh, build a building, uh, to be able to host and to house and to just bring some dignity back on some people that do not do not have any means, uh, we call destitute. Father, we uh, recognize that you have given us a lot uh, spiritually, also financially. So, Father, we want to give uh, to uh, people that don't have anything. Uh, but, Father, ultimately that they would know Christ. They would know the one true Christ, the one that not only heals their body, but heals their soul. So, Father, we thank you. We pray that you would uh, continue to work and provide for all needs and everything uh, for your own name, for your own name's sake. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, amen. It's a privilege to be able to partner again with uh, different organizations, and so... Um, just having that opportunity to make a difference across the world is an amazing thing. So, um, you know, as, as you guys give to projects like that, um, just know you're making a difference. And uh, you're stewing, stewarding the resources that God has entrusted to you very well. <clears throat> um, earlier this week, I was uh, reading my Bible. And um, I was in the, the ninth chapter of the book of Isaiah. And it's in the sixth verse of that uh, great uh, book where there's a prophetic pronouncement made regarding the Messiah. And specifically, it mentions his names. And it's interesting that this morning, you know, um, Craig, uh, you know, made reference to um, Christmas and, and how, you know, this glory to God in the highest um, that we usually reserve for Christmas time. Well, the passage in Isaiah 9, 6 is also one that's often uh, spoken of during Christmas time. And it says this, Isaiah 9, 6, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be on his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Now, this uh, prophetic passage, it, it alludes to both the Son of God, um, specifically, but also the union of the Trinity, okay? So in there, it, it, did you pick up on the fact that he's called Mighty God? And when we think about the Lord Jesus Christ, his deity is something that we affirm as Christians. Um, and numerous times throughout the Word of God, his deity is affirmed. We see that, for example, in John 20, verse 27 to 28, where it says, then he said to Thomas, this is after the resurrection, put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. It also said in uh, Isaiah that he would be called Wonderful Counselor. Now, what's interesting about that is that the Spirit of Jesus is uh, the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is referred to in John 14, 26 as the Counselor. 
it says, but the counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. And as we go on in Isaiah, we saw that he's referred to as everlasting father. Now, Jesus' connection to the heavenly father is seen like in John 14, 8 through 10. It says, in his encounter with Philip, this is, uh, he's talking to one of his disciples. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the father. And it is enough for us. And Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Okay? So we see in the Isaiah passage these different Names of the Messiah coming forth and affirmed in the New Testament. Now, the one that's particularly of interest to us today is that he's also called the Prince of Peace. And we also see this affirmed in John's Gospel, John 14, 27. It says, Jesus says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Now, Jesus is called the Prince of Peace. And that's something that we really want to focus in on today. See, we're in a series called Challenging Passages That Challenge Us. And as we look throughout this, uh, in this series, we're looking at some passages that might be kind of hard to understand, or they might be hard especially to apply to our lives. And in this uh, particular message, Jesus is called the Prince of Peace, which we would all receive gladly. But then we come to passages that seem to contradict that very title that Jesus uh, attributes to himself. So we're going to look at this passage. It's found in Luke chapter 12, verse 49 to 53. And uh, let's go ahead and stand as we read our key text today. This is Luke 12, 49 to 53. Jesus says, I came to cast fire on the earth, and would that it were already kindled. I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how great is my distress until it is accomplished. Do you think that I have come to give peace on earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. For from now on in one house, there will be five divided, three against two and two against three. They will be divided, father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Okay, let's go ahead and have a seat. So how do you make sense of this passage in light of the fact that Jesus is called the Prince of Peace. So for us to kind of understand, we need to understand that there are different kinds of peace. And I just want to mention three of them right now. The first kind of peace, um, it's probably the most important peace, is what we would say is the peace with God. The peace with God. Now, this is affirmed in Romans 5, chapter, chapter 5, verse 1. It says, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, uh, when I worked at the city of Seattle, um, I was working with one of my colleagues there, and I was sharing with him about the Lord and talking to him about uh, Jesus. And I'll never forget what he said to me. He said, um, you know, me and God, we're good. He said, we're good. I, in fact, I think, he's, I think I'm one of his favorites. And uh, the way he said it, though, what he was implying is, you don't need to talk to me about Jesus because me and God, we're good already. And I think 
that sentiment is what many people in our world kind of think. You know, if they do believe that there is a God, oftentimes they think, hey, I'm good with God. And usually it's because they feel like they're good with God because they're pretty good. In other words, when they think about their life compared to a lot of other people, they kind of go, you know what? I think I'm going to make the cut because I, I, I'm not the best person. I'm not a saint, but then again, I'm not like this worst of sinners, and so I think I'm good. They can't conceive of them being, you know, because they are apart from Christ, that from God's perspective, they are actually God's enemy. That's what the scripture says. In Romans 5, 8 through 11, it says, But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God that through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. I mean, this passage speaks of before Christ, we're an enemy of God. We are on a path toward experiencing God's wrath. But because of what Christ did, we could be reconciled to him. This is the peace that God offers all people to be, to have a peace with God. Because the offer is to all people because God's heart is that none would perish, but all would come to repentance. Now the peace with God should lead to the second type of peace, and that's the peace of God. Now the peace of God is offered to all Christians. This is a piece where we hand over our worries, we hand over our concerns, we hand over our anxieties, and we lay it at the feet of Christ. In 1 Peter 5, 6 through 7, it says, Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he might, at the proper time, that he might exalt you, casting all your anxieties upon him because he cares for you. Now, the closer we stay to God, the more we'll experience the peace of God. There's a picture I'd like to show you. I think this picture captures this whole sentiment of the peace of God. In this picture, you see God's hands, and that child in the hand of God, that represents us. And like a child, we could sit in the very hand of God, having brought all of our cares, all of our anxieties, and all of the worries that plague us, and we could have this peace, the peace of God. This peace of God is found in so many places, but especially for many of us who have walked with Jesus, Philippians 4, 6, and 7 has been a life verse for many of us. And it says, do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now, I know many of you have memorized that, that verse or those, those verses. And it's good to hide that, that passage in your heart. Because all of us will face times of worry and anxiety and fear and things like that. And the invitation is, come to God in prayer. And when you cast all your anxiety upon him, when you bring all of your concerns to him, you could experience the very peace of God even before he answers that prayer. And it's not the peace that you experience after you've gone through something. It's the peace that you could experience while you're going through it that is so unique to the Christian faith because we have a God who cares about us. Now, what's described in the Luke passage that we read, that we stood up and read, is what I would refer to as the peace with others. That's the third kind of peace. 
And so when Jesus said in verse 51, do you think that I have come to give peace on the earth? No. No, I tell you, but rather division. And that's a hard word. Division. Now, what we understand is this, is that this is a statement of reality, not a statement of desire. So Jesus is just speaking reality here. See, Jesus knew that there would be some who would receive him, but there would be many who will not. And so because there will be some in some families who would receive him, but in that very same family, there would be others who reject him, there would be division. There would be strife. And it wasn't his heart that there would be division, but he was expressing reality that this is what would happen. Jesus is sort of this dividing rod have you ever noticed that if you, if you look at actually the world's population, actually the vast majority of people believe in God, at least believe that there is a God. And so if you were to talk to people about God, you would largely get no objection. But you talk to them about Jesus, all of a sudden there's division. You start getting very specific about who Jesus is and what he's done, and that's where you're going to start seeing the objections. That's when you're going to start seeing the pushback. That's when you're going to start seeing, hey, I'm good. God and me, we're good. I was uh, talking to a friend, and um, he was just sharing how he's been you know, trying to share uh, with folks about Jesus, you know, and we have a lot of common friends, um, and uh, you know, he just tells me, you know, that uh, from time to time as he gets together with uh, these friends, that he's been trying to share with them about who Jesus is, and you know, it was so encouraging to me, and I and I and I um, mentioned to him, I said, you know, four or five years ago, you wouldn't have said that. What you would have said is you were trying to, you know, you've been talking to the people about God. I thought, you know what? Isn't it interesting? Because the gospel is not Jesus, or the gospel is not God loves you. And he has a wonderful plan for your life. That may be the prelude for the gospel, but it's not the gospel. When Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, you know what, I deliver to you what I received of first importance. First importance, that Christ died for our sins. And that he was buried according to the scripture. And he was raised after three days according to the scripture. See, Paul said this is of first importance. This is primary. This is the gospel in a nutshell. That it's Jesus who died for our sins. And it's Jesus who was buried according to the scripture and he was raised after three days according to the scripture. And faith is required. Faith in Jesus is required if we are going to experience eternal life. And so while we may tell people that God loves them, which is absolutely true, and I would recommend it, if we want to see people actually come into a saving relationship with him, they have to deal with Jesus, his death for their sin, his resurrection to life, and his offer of eternal life to each one of us, a brand new life. Uh, back in June, we had our brother Hien share his testimony, and it's been an ongoing testimony over the years as he's given us regular updates about what's been happening. And for those of you who might be new to our church, uh, you may not have heard, 
Kian's testimony. And basically, um, when he came to Christ out of a rich and long tradition of being part of a Buddhist family, it, it rocked the whole family's world. And because of his faith in Jesus, he was ostracized from his own family. And the power of his testimony is that um, he made a decision to follow Christ. And because of that decision to follow Christ, he not only called off his own wedding because his fiance was not a believer, but then he led his brother's fiance to the Lord and then she had to call off her wedding to his very own brother And his whole family just disowned him and ostracized him for years. But he stayed true to the Lord. And he patiently took every opportunity he could to share Christ with his other family members. And after years of the relational thaw uh, happening, that um, one by one, not only has his immediate family, but his extended family, many of them have come to know Jesus as their savior. It's a beautiful testimony, but I can't imagine what it was like at the beginning of that story when he made the decision, I'm gonna follow Jesus knowing that this is gonna cause division in my family knowing that this is going to cause tremendous pain to those folks who I dearly love. And yet he did it. You know, if you were going to follow Christ, you could face division within your own family. And I know that there are, there are many of you here who your parents are not believers, and there's been a measure of pushback because of that, and I just want to commend you for continuing to follow the Lord. Even in Christian homes, if you make decisions to follow Christ, sometimes even in a Christian home, you might receive pushback, and there might be a measure of hardship and division. I've heard stories of, of college students who are starting to get involved in their campus ministry and their parents are pushing back on them. Their Christian parents are saying, you need to study and not spend so much time with this Christian group. When I um, decided to go into ministry, I had to make a choice. I was, you know, in my, in my career. And I remember my mother, my mom saying to me, you need to do what God's calling you to do. And in that way, she just blessed me in that. But I remember what my father said. My dad wasn't so gracious in, in terms of that decision that I was trying to wrestle with. And um, he said three things to me that really stuck out of my mind. He said, why can't you just be a volunteer? He said, um, I wouldn't do it. It's the hardest job in the world and you can't please everyone. And then thirdly, he said, who do you think you are anyway? And that one cut really deep. And I remember having to wrestle Russell with this thought of, yeah, who am I and why would I even consider doing this? And it made it especially hard knowing that I didn't have his blessing to do it. But, you know, even though there was, there was that opposition for my own Christian father, um, it was a blessing because it made my resolve stronger and I had to really think through my calling, and that's helped me to persevere. 
And years later, I mean, he was, it was amazing because years later, he was part of our church and he was very affirming. And, and you know, at the end of the story, it's great, you know. Um, but at the beginning of the story, it was really hard. I wonder how many of you who are Christian parents, do you really have as your highest hope that your children will follow Jesus no matter what? That it may, you know, they may want to join a parachurch organization and they're going to be, get this, they're going to ask people for money. And you're their parent and you sent them to college. And you didn't send them to college so that they would ask people for money. You sent them to college so that they could give money maybe to support Well, what if they make that decision? Is your heart of hearts that they would love Jesus and follow him no matter what? See, when Jesus said that there was going to be division in a family, it was a statement of reality. But it was also a statement of priority. And we really see that very clearly in the parallel passage from Matthew's gospel. And let's look at what Matthew uh, recorded in this parallel passage from Matthew 10, 34 through 37. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Wow, that makes it really clear. Jesus, no bones about it. He says you have to love me greater and more than even your own children even your own parents, even your most closest family members. There's a dividing line. And Jesus says, "Will you? do you love me? Do you love me? You know, some of the things that I'm uh, encouraged by, what I see in our, in our church family that uh, really indicate that we see people growing in this love for Jesus and their willingness to, to just um, follow him. Um, you know, when we commission these, uh, these people to go to gleanings, I notice families, some families are going, and they're spending their summer not at a resort, but in working in the hot sun. And I think, wow, that's a great example that people want to follow Jesus. I'm encouraged that um, parents at times will ask for prayer. And uh, it's for their children to follow the Lord Jesus. And when I hear that kind of prayer, prayer request, it just makes me think, yes, yes, yes. That is exactly what we want. We want our kids to follow Jesus. I'm encouraged by young adults and uh, um, how they, they ask, how do I honor my non-believing parents? How do I do this in a Christ-honoring way? And that shows me that they're moving and growing in following Jesus. Um, I've just been encouraged that, you know, today we had this room set up by these men, many of them young adults who, generally speaking, you know, they would probably be sleeping in until 10 o'clock if they didn't have to get up early to set this place up. But it's in getting up early, they're saying, Jesus, you're worth it. Our worship team that practices during the week to come and lead us in worship, it's because Jesus is worth it. 
And these different examples of people saying Jesus is worth it just encourages me so much. I was just looking at our community groups and, you know, we have almost, I don't know, 240 or so people that are participating in community groups and, um, you know, they're meeting together. They... And it's not convenient oftentimes. It's, it was actually much more convenient if you remember when we were meeting on Zoom, right? And yet they're meeting together and it's not convenient, but they're saying Jesus is worth it. And following him and growing in him is worth it. You know, um, one of the most compelling stories of, in the whole of scripture is found in the Old Testament. And this story is found in Genesis 22. And it's the story of when God commanded Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac. And I'd love to read the story to you. From verse 20, uh, chapter 22, verses 1 through 8, it says, After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. And he said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son, Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering, and he rose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife So they went, both of them, together. And Isaac said to his father Abraham, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them, together. Just reflect on that for a moment. God has asked the unthinkable. God has asked Abraham to sacrifice the son that he had been waiting for all those years. And without questioning, Abraham prepared to do what God had asked him to do. And it says that it was a three days journey. And can you imagine what it was like for those three days as Abraham is just wrestling with God. Why, God? Why would you ask this of me? And he's making his way, and he sees Mount Moriah from a distance. And then his son Isaac asks the most innocent question of all. Hey, we have the wood. We have the fire. Where's the lamb? That must have cut right into Abraham's heart. I mean, I could just imagine him shaking, just knowing that he's been called to sacrifice his own son. And yet he's resolute and he's determined to do what God had asked him to do. And he gets all the way to the mountain and he prepares the wood and he binds his own son and prepares to offer him just as the Lord had asked him. The Lord stops him. And the scriptures tell us that there was a a ram caught in the thicket and God provided the ram. As I think about that story, I think of Abraham and how he wrestled And yet he was so obedient to offer even his own most beloved son to the Lord. 
And when, it, when, I, when I think about that and we reflect on our passage today and how our passage talks about there will be division in a family, and it's not just a statement of reality, but it's a statement of priority and how we're called to choose Jesus, to follow him no matter what, no matter what he says that it'll cost us that we say yes to him. I want us to think about not only Abraham's story and his willingness, but I want us to think about God's story. Because when God asks us to even do the unthinkable and go against our family and what they may think, we must understand that God he didn't spare his own son. That when the time was right, he sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law. And this son was sacrificed on our behalf. There was no staying of God's hand. There was no ram caught in the thicket to take the place of Jesus. God sacrificed his own son. And so when we think it's unreasonable and unthinkable to go against the ones we love the most to follow Jesus, just know this, that God did the unthinkable. And he sent and gave his son for us so that we might have life and might have it to the full so that we might have this precious gift of a relationship with him through our faith in Christ. See, God not only calls us and demands even that we choose him above everything else, but we need to know that he chose us at the cost of his own son. Today, uh, as the uh, music team comes up, uh, what I want us to do today is I want to offer you a decision to make. And that's just, even now, right now, just decide in your heart not to let any relationship keep you from following the Lord's will for your life. Don't let any earthly relationship keep you from following the Lord's will for your life. You know, um, I know, I know um, there are uh, people here and you're here and you're married, but you're not with your spouse. And maybe it's because your spouse has no spiritual appetite, but you're here because you're here to worship the Lord. And I just want to commend you for that. Because I know others that they, they're not here, they would like to be here, but their spouse isn't. And they're making a choice to follow their spouse into sin versus following the Lord into his will. So decide in your heart not to let any relationship keep you from following Jesus and his will for your life. And then, especially if you're a parent or even if you want to be a future parent, resolve in your heart that you want your children to follow God's will more than anything else. You know, your hopes and dreams for them to be whatever it is that you want them to be in their career, would you just put that on the altar and say, you know what, more than that, more than that, I want them to follow Jesus. Let's go ahead and stand. Let's, let's go before the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we've 
looked at this passage that is really challenging. And you said that you did not come to bring peace, but division. And Lord, I, I do pray, God, I pray that within our families, there would be unity and not division, but that unity would be around Jesus and following him. And Lord, I pray for strength and courage for those people that are seeking to follow you and yet they're in relationships, maybe in a marriage or maybe their parents or maybe their kids, they're not following you. And I pray, God, that you would strengthen them. Strengthen them to, to keep on keeping on, to, to follow you as best as they can. Lord, I thank you that you are so worth it. Lord, and you understand. You understand where we're at, the challenges we face. God, I pray for especially those parents here who have been pushing and pushing their kids to academic excellence, which is not a bad thing, but they really haven't been encouraging them to follow you. And the message their kids are receiving is education is more important than Jesus. A career is more important than Jesus. And Lord, I just pray that we would change that message. And that our kids and our family members and our close friends would know that there's nothing, nothing more important and nothing better than following you with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our strength, and all of our mind. Lord, as a church, I pray that we would encourage one another because there are times when following you is challenging and we need one another. And so I pray blessing over our community groups that these places, these groups would be a place where people could be encouraged to follow you more faithfully. Thank you, Lord God. You are the Lord. You're a creator. You're a heavenly father. You're a savior. You're our Lord. And we commit ourselves to you again. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We have uh, intercessors that are going to be here on the sides. And so if you'd like to receive prayer for anything, uh, please come up and, and receive prayer. We'd love to intercede for you. Thanks. And as we uh, continue to worship, uh, the song of response, um, man, we're just going to sing uh, the song, um, It Is Well. And uh, there might be things that, that Pastor Joe mentioned that you, you're you going to struggle with and you're, you're fighting with and you're wrestling with. Um, but that my prayer is that these, these words and uh, this song would, would be a, a fuel and a vessel to, to, to proclaim that it is well with your soul um, and in your heart, God, in your head, and in, 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 in your head as well, so that we can, we can fully worship the Lord.
we the church who bear your light, lamp of flame, city bright, king and kingdom, come is what we pray. We need a fresh wind, the fragrance of heaven. The power of your presence, pour your spirit out, 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 pour
want to remind you that our picnic is going to be taking place right after the service. Um, if you could also help us, though, we're going to allow our servant hands team and our worship team to uh, get their food first because they have to then come back and tear things down. So we're going to let them go first. But while they're getting their food, we could um, take the chairs down for them. And so uh, that way we could minister to, to the, that team. Um, also, if you're new to our church family, love to meet you. I'll be up here for a little while before I go to the picnic. So just love to, to meet you if you're new. Uh, I'm going to pray for the food, and then I'm going to pronounce a blessing over us. So would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, thank you that you have poured your spirit out on us. Thank you that you are the Prince of Peace. Lord, and we thank you that we could gather as a church family today to enjoy the great food that's uh, going to be served and just to um, get to know one another better. And so I pray your blessing on our time at the picnic. Thank you for all the hands that have helped make the food and uh, prepare the tables. Thank you, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now let me pronounce a blessing over you. The Lord said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to us and given to him. So therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that Christ has commanded us, and surely he's going to be with us always to the very end of the age. Amen. Amen. Thanks for coming.